I invite you now to pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we offer our thanks for this day. And we pray that you will be with us now in the person of your Holy Spirit, inspiring the words of Scripture as we read them, so that they may come alive in our hearing, that they may give us a new perspective on living today, but most of all, that we may hear your call to discipleship within them. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the living Word. Amen. Listen to Scripture as I read it to you from the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Mark. This is from the seventh chapter. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know that he was there. Yet, he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast out the demon that was in her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first. For it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the, daughter, the child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. And they returned from the region of Tyre, and went by way of Sidon, towards the Sea of Galilee, in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Ephpatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I read that, I was just struck by the sentence. You know, he ordered them to tell no one and was, you know, then the more he ordered them to keep quiet about it, the more they proclaimed it zealously. You are to tell absolutely no one about this sermon I'm preaching today. <laughs> My message today is about church priorities. Poland Presbyterian Church can't do everything, and it cannot be everything to all that people want it to be. No church can do that or be that. And so the question is, what are our priorities? Given what we have, what do we place first? What's second? What's third? This morning I want to examine those priorities in terms of one woman's challenge that changed the scope of Jesus' ministry, literally changed what Jesus was doing. Then I want to look at Poland Presbyterian Church's priorities. As we return from vacation and begin this programmatic year, what are our priorities here in Poland? Third, I want to reflect upon how Poland Presbyterian Church is now as a congregation and will challenge its priorities for the coming years. Well, let's take them one by one. Let's look at the text itself. Mark described the woman as a Gentile. She was of Syrophoenician descent. She was not Jewish. She was a Greek. Her daughter was ill with an unclean spirit, and she came seeking Jesus for his healing powers. Now, in Mark's gospel, this was a defining moment in his ministry. How would Jesus respond to someone who was not Jewish, someone who was not of his own religion? Now we might be shocked by his initial response because it 
borders almost on the insulting. What did he say? He said, let the children be fed first, for it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. The children were the children of Israel. In effect, Jesus was saying, listen, my ministry is to my own people. It wouldn't be fair to them if I took my time healing everyone who came along, much less your daughter. Was he testing her? We're not sure. Was he verbally probing to measure her faith? We don't know. But the Syrophoenician woman, this woman of Greek descent, stood her ground with Jesus, telling him that even dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table. And ironically, when she returned home, her daughter was healed. But most importantly for us, in this particular moment in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus' ministry expands, and it expands radically. No longer is his mission solely to the Hebrew people, to people of his own kind. Now it had spread, and it was including Greeks, Gentiles. Indeed, it was a universal mission to all of humanity. We often forget that Jesus was a Jew. He was raised in a Jewish home. All indications are that he kept kosher. He quoted the only Bible he knew, which was the Hebrew Bible. He preached in synagogues. He spoke Aramaic. He was through and through a Jew. His encounter with this Greek woman challenged the scope of his ministry and his mission. It was no longer to just taking care of his own people, the people of Israel. Mark has clearly stated that from this moment on, his mission is universal. It is to all of humanity, and that includes you and me. I believe that the Syrophoenician woman brings the same challenge to congregations today. We are, after all, the continuing body of Christ. Are we all about ourselves and our people? Will we allow ourselves to turn inwardly and only take care of our own? Or are we willing to broaden our priorities, to think greater than we have in the past? During this past year, a committee of this congregation developed a mission study and this study examined Poland Presbyterian Church's history, also where we are now. It also developed a statement about what Poland Presbyterian Church's priorities should be as a congregation going forward. It was not an easy task. And it's not an easy task for any congregation to do this because a con congregations are diverse. And this one is diverse. People here have different priorities. They have different reasons why they come here. There's a tension among the competing demands and the expectations that a congregation has. And when a congregation has limited resources, and every congregation, large and small, has a limit to its resources, how do we use those resources? What do we use them for? Is it, do we use them to take care of the members who are here? And is that more important than reaching out to potential new ones, to strangers, to those who are not like us? Jesus' encounter with the Syrophoenician woman challenges us to move beyond our own parochialism. It challenges us to ask the hard questions about who we are and whom we are called to serve. Are we merely a spiritual health club that meets its, the spiritual needs of our members? Or are we part of some global movement that clings to a vision of the transformation of society, indeed, the world itself? How do we deal with the tensions of being good stewards of this property 
the need for good programming, and the challenges of a changing neighborhood and a changing world. Those things present us with tensions. Today, as we kick off our Sunday school year, we must also wrestle with the question of, are we going to give our children the food that they need, or merely shove some crumbs off the table and let them pick them up? How are we fulfilling the vows that we took before God to nurture our children at the time of their baptism? I want to challenge Poland Presbyterian Church's priorities. Think about it. They told me when I came to Ohio I could use illustrations of college football and most of the people would understand them. We are two weeks into college football season. This year, a number of schools hired new coaches, and then with them, the new coaches brought to their campuses new ideas, new formations, and new approaches to the game. Some are succeeding, but many are having some difficulty. Why? Well, they don't have the types of players that they need for their program and their new ideas. In other words, these coaches don't have the players they need to implement the formations and the game plans that they have. But here's a maxim. Good coaches should begin with what they have, with the players that they have, and adapt. And I think the same thing is true for congregations. We need to begin with the players we have to develop a mission and a ministry based upon the gifts that God has given us not the gifts that we wish we had. Remember? When Jesus was faced with the challenge of feeding 4,000 or 5,000 people, depending on whether you're reading Matthew or Luke, what did he have to feed them? He had two fish and a dozen loaves. He wished he had more, but that's what he had, and so that's where he began. He did not whine about what he wished he had. I think the biggest mistake that we clergy make is to fail to take into consideration the gifts that God has given to the congregations that we serve. You know, pursuing instead some generic vision of what a church should be, something that we read perhaps in the latest pastoral how-to book. I'm going to say it. Poland Presbyterian Church should not strive to be some crystal cathedral or some mega church. If it strives to do that, it will be the most unhappy place you can imagine. It should strive to be a faithful village church that ministers to the needs in this community, to the children within this community, and to then spread out beyond that because there's needs far beyond here. We need to begin with the gifts that God has given us. And here is what Poland Presbyterian Church has. First, I'm going to use the first person, plural. We are intelligent and educated. Pat yourselves on the back, folks. It is a value that we have as a congregation. We think about things. We study things. Maybe we study them too much. We send our children to school. We listen to public radio. We read books and we enjoy entertainment and social events that cause us to think. We value education. Poland Presbyterian Church gives an amazing amount of resources to its students who are attending higher education, it's colleges and schools, through scholarships, much more than any congregation that I have served in 40 years of ministry. Very few churches do that. And so the first gift that we have, the one we need to acknowledge is that Poland Presbyterian Church values education and it values intelligence. Second, we have a beautiful facility. I know it could be nicer, and there are things that we are addressing to deal with that. But we need to offer thanks for previous generations who gave you know, very generously so that we could enjoy this campus, this building, and this amazing facility. It was a gift that was given to this generation, a gift that we will pass on to future generations. Third, we have location. 
I know the real estate maxim is what? Location, location, location. You know, it is important for congregations also. I must say, as your interim pastor, you know, I have never had the joy of driving up to a church that occupied such a beautiful part of a community. Just driving in here every morning is an uplift. Celebrate that, folks. It's gorgeous. This location is prime. Amazing curb appeal. People don't have to look to find the building. That is something that is a gift that we have. The fourth one is Poland Presbyterian Church has tradition, over 200 years of it. They weren't all good years, but we're still here. And in better shape than most organizations that, have this, that are this old, both ecclesiastical and otherwise. Tradition still counts, and our history is our strength. Fifth, Poland Presbyterian Church has critical mass. There's still people here. That's not true in all churches. There are young people, people of all ages before me, even at this 8.30 service. That's not true at all congregations. There is an endowment here that you know, helps to resource you know, much of our work. There is a facility that is functional and useful. But here's the challenge. Will Poland Presbyterian Church leverage its assets in order to achieve its mission? I think there's a relationship between reward and risk. You know, Jesus always emphasized mission over maintenance. Faith, my friends, does not exist if there is no risk. Faith is not a sure thing. Faith involves risk. That's why Kierkegaard used the expression, leap of faith. And there's one other gift that we have, and it's the most important gift. And it's a gift that we forget. And that gift is the gift of the Holy Spirit and God's gift of prayer. It's a gift that has been given to all of us and is perhaps, as I mentioned, the most important and most powerful gift that we have. Poland Presbyterian Church needs to use this gift and be a praying, risking, believing community of 21st century disciples. We need to take what God has given to us and use it faithfully. And I believe that ministry grows out of the gifts that God has bestowed upon us. And you perhaps know other gifts than those six that I've just mentioned. We need to use the loaves and the fishes that we have and stop whining about what we don't have. And we need to get to work. This is the challenge that I see for Poland Presbyterian Church. I'm going to underscore three basic challenges, and there are many more. First, the world, this world needs Christians who think. Christians who think. Christians who question are, and are not afraid to wrestle with their doubts. The world does not need more people who blindly follow some glib guru into perdition. It needs people of faith who think, who hear the call of Christ even amidst the complexities of this postmodern world. The world needs smart Christians who are versed in the sacred texts of the Bible, but also science, economics, history, literature, technology, the arts, language, and other areas of knowledge. That's why Presbyterians have started over 100 colleges and universities in this country. Some of them are finest institutions of learning today. Poland Presbyterian Church needs to be a place where people of faith gather, people who are not afraid of growing intellectually and spiritually in the faith. When we enter this building, we should park our cars outside, but we shouldn't park our brains at the door. Second, we need to understand that the most crucial program in the life of this congregation is its Christian education program. Notice I said Christian education program and not Sunday school. Here's the reality. Sunday has become one more day of the week. Businesses are open on Sundays now. Sports events have scheduled heavily on Sundays. We can wring our hands, we can cry into our towels about this, but here's the news, it's not gonna change. 
thriving congregations adapt. Thriving congregations adapt. They also offer high quality educational events that parents and others will make a priority. But we cannot hire someone merely to run it and believe we've taken care of it. Christian education is a responsibility of every member here. When we baptize a child, there's a child here today that I baptized. You, all of you stood up at that service and you, you heard the question, do you as members of the Church of Jesus Christ promise to guide, nurture, and encourage this child by word and deed with love? What an amazing promise or vow that you made, but you made it before God. And I believe that we are accountable to God for fulfilling that sacred vow. If the children are to be fed first, education is the primary responsibility of this entire congregation. Last, we should wear our history proudly. Churches relate to history and tradition in one of two ways. Some congregations allow history to shackle them to ways of doing things and a vision that is no longer valid. It literally becomes the albatross around their neck, keeping them wed to the past and not faithful to God's call in Christ. But the other option is for history and tradition to be a springboard empowering us to enter and face the future. History and the history of Poland Presbyterian Church is the story of change and adaptation. We need to study it. We need to understand it. And then we need to move forward recognizing that we too are making history. Will our history be worth remembering? Folks, vacation's over. We now face the challenge of our priorities. The story of Jesus with the Syrophoenician woman broadened his vision of his mission. Let the children be fed first. It is no longer merely the children that are like him. No. It was broadened to include all the children of the world, even ours. The challenge for us is to broaden our understanding of the gifts that God has given to us and to all God's children whom we are called to feed. This is the challenge, but it is also the good news. Amen.